fill in it. What? You thought I was going to drift? In a Ford Escape with front-wheel drive? <laughs> You're crazy. Initial D. Ah uh, yes, the manga and anime series that told the story of Takumi Fujiwara, a teenager who uses a modified Toyota AE86 to deliver tofu every morning on Mount Akina since he was 12 years old. While he knows hardly anything about cars, he happens to be a natural-born drifter and develops a love for illegal mountain racing. Combined with intense high-speed battles, memorable characters who race for pride, and a kick-ass Eurobeat soundtrack, it has become perhaps the most beloved racing-based anime in the world. And along with its big success in the late 90s and 2000s came 23 video games. The early initial D games were primitive and good to say the least, but hot damn, when Sega Rosa's arcade stage series hit the market, oh, there was nothing else close to it. With 11 different releases since 2001, it has undeniably been one of the most popular and addictive arcade series of recent years. These were games that were anything but your typical family-friendly arcade racers. They are definitely not one of those floor the gas and ignore the brake the entire time types of games. Learning how each vehicle handles, when to shift, and how to go about taking a line were always essential elements. All versions made use of a brilliant cart system, which allowed players to save their car upgrades, best times, and records, making it very competitive. There were even tournaments, and they still go on today. From the beginning, it was an absolute perfect mix of realism and arcade-style gameplay. One where you could choose from several real Japanese manufacturers and part upgrades, but still be able to drift at 100 miles per hour without having to worry about car damage or flying off any guardrails. And let me tell you, man, ever since I picked up this pair of version 2 machines a few months ago, I haven't gone a few days without grinding the crap out of epic mountains like Akaji and Irohazaka for hours on end, just to be my best times. I mean, look at this. This real one-way road in Japan has 28 hairpins. It gets real intense, to say the least. As a hardcore racing game fan, there was nothing more satisfying than improving your technique, getting faster and faster on these difficult courses, and getting closer and closer to world record times. It definitely has a learning curve, and it will take you months to get skilled at, but it's incredibly fair and rewards you tremendously. I will even go as far as arguing that Arcade Stage 2 and 3 are among the absolute best that the racing genre has to offer. The graphics that still look great today, the awesome blend between fantasy and reality, the control that is dead on perfect, the highly competitive gameplay, the incredible Eurobeat soundtrack, and the encouragement to get better and better, all tied in to create a rare driving experience that can be perfectly described as pure bliss. Even if you've never heard of Initial D but are a fan of racing games, then you owe it to yourself to track down a machine and play to your wallet's capacity, or look into the more recent games on the PlayStation consoles. The arcade stage series was very popular in Japan, and still is, but it was never the same case in the United States. The most obvious reason being is that the games are tied to a Japanese anime that most people have never heard of and will cause immediate distaste to anyone who is an anti weeaboo or hates Japanese cars. Also, America's arcade market is, well, kinda dead and is full of casual gamers who don't like to lose. Because of this, American arcade racers like the Cruisin' and Fast and Furious games have been more successful, and it's not hard to understand why. I mean, look at Cruisin' Blast from 2016! With no manual transmission options, a complete absence of a brake pedal, barely any techniques to speak of, and gameplay that's easy enough for practically anyone to be immediately great at, it's giggles and smiles quarter-munching fun for the entire family! Sega, on the other hand, has always been great at making racing games, and they gave American arcade-goers a chance. Oh, they did! We did get Initial D Arcade Stage and its next three installments, but after the fourth release in 2007, we were just not worth the effort it took to export and translate everything. 
So nowadays, it's only the larger American arcades that will have a newer version, and even then, everything is in Japanese which means it turns even more people away from even trying it. But worst of all, we couldn't even get this version which used real moving cars and is one of the most epic things to ever grace existence! <sighs> it's on my bucket list, that's for sure. So, out of 23 Initial D games, the United States has only received 5. Four in the arcades, and one on a home platform. Oh, that's right. What if I told you that an initial D game was actually exclusively released and developed in America? Well, it's true. Initial D Mountain Vengeance on the PC released in 2004. I can imagine American fans seeing this in stores and being so surprised that an initial D game actually made it to retailers. I probably would have bought it if I was a fan at five years old. But could it live up to the arcade stage series, or any of the other games? Well, I guess we have to play it and find out, or else the video would just end right here now, wouldn't it? Ah, cliches. Gotta get pumped for that Eurobeat! Okay, it looks like initial D, but it sure doesn't sound like it. What the hell is this? This is not Eurobeat or anything close to it. Sadly, here we have another poor attempt by Tokyo Pop to Americanize Initial D, and it doesn't really fit. Did you mean to use this song? I mean, this is okay, but it doesn't scream Japanese toke racing. You're kidding, right? It's in the main menu too? Oh, oh. So at the main menu, you can select from three major options. The play mode, which is the main game mode. A quick race, which will literally throw you into a randomized battle and will not let you select anything, so it's more like a absolutism race. And the game options, where you can change the controls to your liking and enable special FX. Woo! In the play mode, the game will ask you to enter whatever you feel like calling yourself for today, and then you get the team and character selection, which at first is just limited to Takumi. Or... Attack. Yes, sadly this game prefers to call these characters by the names that Tokyo Pop assigned to them in their dub of the anime. Because, you know, Americans are just too stupid to pick up on Japanese names. Sure, everyone refers to this guy as Ikatani in the original anime, but someone at Tokyo Pop thought that Cole was a good alternative. Then comes the course selection of just under 5 mountains, though Akina is the only available one at first. And finally, you select your opponent, which, again, is just limited to one option. At this point, it is clear that Initial D Authoritarian Vengeance believes that democracy must be earned, which is truly shameful. Alright guys, this is the starting line. Three, two, one, go! Mountain Vengeance. I knew you liked this song, but I didn't know you liked it to the point where it's the only one in the game. If you like it, then that's fine, we're still friends, but I think it's common sense for any developer to not just have the same song in the intro, main menu, during the gameplay, and even during the damn installation. Yeah, seriously, they felt it was necessary to include it during the installation process too. 
can you at least give me something, oh, I don't know, different to listen to? Fortunately enough, that something different does exist in this game. But, it must be unlocked. Let me elaborate on this. You have to beat the game to allow your ears to listen to something that is not... And unfortunately, those unlockable songs are just more of the Tokyo Pop crap, which is mediocre rock, lousy hip-hop, and bad rap. Still far from Eurobeat, the genre that defies Initial D. So anyway, you've been staring at the gameplay for a little bit now. What do you think? Yeah, the AE86 looks pretty good. It's one of the main reasons why a mid-80s Toyota Corolla is actually awesome. Except, uh, this is not Takumi's AE86. Uh, that, that font's not correct, and it does not say Torino anywhere. And the game likes to refer to the legendary vehicle as just a beat-up delivery car. Yeah, there you go. That sums it up perfectly. Other than the vehicles not being completely accurate, the models look okay, but remember, this is a 2004 PC game, and it appears to be about four years behind the ball. There's not a whole lot of scenery, the textures are bland, most of the trees appear to be two-dimensional, and overall it just doesn't feel like you're on a mountain pass. Something is off, there are no breathtaking views. It's like they just put this fake AE86 on a random road and said, There you go kids, it's talk time, enjoy! <laughs> <gasps> Another drawback to the graphics is that you won't see much of them, because every battle takes place at night, and the draw distance is one of the worst I've seen in a racer. Honestly, the draw distance in Cruisin' USA, a game that's 10 years older, is much more acceptable because it was due to hardware limitations, not lazy programming. Your headlights just barely give you enough light to see anything. You'll be going into most corners blindly with only a basic map to help you, which isn't on track half of the time. See right here, I'm on the road, everything's fine, but then, oh, I guess I'm suddenly intoxicated. Another highly important part of any racing game is your confidence behind the wheel, which will be in a state of depression for any player no matter their skills. This is due to the beautifully lackluster controls. It's very hard to describe, but unless you break a lot while going into a corner, you're more than likely going to hit a wall. Of course, heavily using the brakes in a simulation-based racing game is to be expected, but if you couldn't tell already, this is not one of those, and it's not really arcadey either. It's a strange mix of the two that I haven't quite figured out yet. They're not the worst controls in the world, they're just really difficult to get the hang of. If you don't want to hit anything, you just kind of have to cautiously inch your way around the corners. But what about techniques, you ask? Well. Any and all techniques that you've learned from the arcade stage series don't work. No eraser, no machine gun shifting, and no fainting techniques to apply here. All you have is a drift button. Yes, it is a button, but it doesn't work how you would expect it to. It just kind of helps you turn better. But most impressively, and I am just floored that this even exists, the controls are so imprecise, so unstable, and so out of whack that you cannot even drive straight. Yes, you may have your foot on the gas and the wheel completely centered, but every two seconds it appears that the power steering turns its back on you and goes, Nope. I can't even begin to understand how you screw something like this up. No matter your control configuration, every vehicle will twitch. This is even more noticeable during the start of battles. They jitter all around like a little kid who's about to piss his pants. Now, you would think that keeping the car stable before the start of a race would be an easy task. Every single racing game that I have ever played or seen has you starting completely lined up and stationary, or sometimes there will be a rolling start. That's normal, right? Well, folks, I'm sorry to break the news, but it appears that this is the only racing game in existence that has a rare case of dislocated spawnphobia. All right, guys, this is the starting line. Three, two, one, go! I can't believe I'm saying this, but every time you start, you and your opponent will spawn in different positions and locations. What the hell is going on? Examples include being crooked, trading paint, a generous gift of a head start, and if you're really lucky, the game won't even let you control the car at all.
again. Likewise with the twitching. I don't understand how you screw something like this up. What other racing game does this? It's absolutely embarrassing. Now let's talk about the mountains. It appears that the game designers, Canopy and ValueSoft, had the intention to physically model them after their real life counterparts, which is great, but things are not what they seem. Akuna in the arcade stage series is completely downhill in the northeast direction, which is accurate to the real life equivalent. Here's an example. Now here's Mountain Vengeance's interpretation of the same section. Ninety percent of the road feels like it's flat, and during the first major corner, you actually go up! In fact, no matter if you race in the downhill or uphill directions, you'll be doing both at the same time! For every upslope, there's a downslope! It's as if the developers couldn't figure out how to make any of the mountains go higher than 10 feet! I mean, I'm not asking for a politically correct interpretation, but it's just incredibly laughable how extremely imprecise these mountains are. You can't tell them apart from each other, and they're more like really long, bad roller coasters. With an on average completion time of 5 minutes, and everything always looking the same, they feel very dragged out. There are no epic hairpins to master or gutters to remember these courses for. They are all one and the same. Now with only a maximum of four to choose from, you would think that it wouldn't take you very long to beat the game and relieve your precious eardrums from inevitably bleeding. But because there are only four mountains in the game, the developers felt the need to divide each one into four sections and require you to race through them separately before tackling the entire course. Not only does this get highly repetitive, but on three of the four mountains, this process is required to be done twice. Akaji, for example, must be raced against Keisuke in four sections, then in its entirety. But next you have to beat Ryusuke too! So then you have to do the same four sections again, and in its entirety once more in order to unlock Miyogi, only to do the same repetitive grinding repeatedly. Basically, the game forces you to race on the same course 10 times in a row for 20 minutes before you can even unlock the next one. It is inconceivable to design a racing game like this, but yet again, Initial D Oppressive Vengeance breaks the fourth wall. And keep in mind, it expects you to listen to Initialize throughout your entire playthrough, but if you're smart, you will have already done the job. No regrets! Now, it would be reasonable to expect that the different opponents would give you a challenge to partially make up for this repetitive gameplay, but unfortunately it's worse than we thought. Oh god. This game also has a rare case of artificial intelligence monotonism. Every opponent will always travel at a maximum speed of 80 kilometers per hour while you can blow right by them at 150, making every battle mind-numbingly easy. It's a range, sometimes it'll be 75, maybe closer to 85, but the problem is, because you're going about twice as fast, they can't touch you, ever. Once you pass them, you're not going to see them again, unless you mess up big time or on purpose. But how easy exactly are these battles? Well, I did a test and floored the gas while turning right throughout the complete run of an entire course. Not only did I win by quite a lot, but at no point did my speed dip below 75 kilometers per hour. This means that you can constantly ram your car against the guardrails and still go faster than most of the opponents in the game. And even then, your speed keeps changing constantly, so you can most likely beat even the faster opponents that are going 85 or 90 kilometers. So this game, uh, it, it hasn't really figured out its uh, challenge thing yet. Uh, 
kind of sucks, but, you know, maybe we can look elsewhere for a challenge. Let's see if there's multiplayer. There's got to be multiplayer, right? Let's, let's see here. Mm, no, there's there's no multiplayer. There's no multiplayer, which means that there cannot be anything remotely challenging ever. I mean, I wouldn't really want to do multiplayer, and neither would any of your friends. If, if they do, they're probably not your friends, but it would just be funny to see who could grind their way to the finish first. So it is clear that the developers did not understand how to make challenging AI and had zero understanding of quality physics. Or maybe they just, you know, didn't give a shit. Precisely like how the player doesn't have to give a shit to win battles. If every opponent has nothing even remotely challenging to bring to the table, and you can grind your way to every single victory, then clearly your game is dysfunctional. It is basically telling the player, Yeah. Let's see those corners. They're not really there. You're just tripping like I am. There is little to no incentive to drive well. Who cares if you're slamming into walls left and right? Who cares about executing decent lines? It's not even worth enhancing your experience by turning on manual transmission because it doesn't work. This tachometer is a joke, but even more impressive, you can start out in fifth gear and then get to your top speed just as quickly. B -b okay, thinking about using a decent steering wheel and pedals? Forget it! With cars that twitch every two seconds, it's useless. You don't even have to sit up straight. Slouching is highly recommended. It's all because this game has an I don't care how you drive attitude. If you attempt to drive cleanly, the game's limited visibility, twitchy vehicles, and lack of challenge will indefinitely screw you over from having any sort of satisfaction. Initial D no f**ks given vengeance lacks practically everything that makes a good racing game a good racing game. And just the idea that it bears the Initial D name is a massive insult to the series. Butchering these legendary mountains with zero respect, taking these memorable characters and infecting them with AI monotonism, and choosing the piss-poor Tokyo Pop soundtrack over the original Eurobeat were all decisions that can be described as sinful. It's really quite sad that out of all the Initial D games, this was the only one that got into American retailers. Even Initial D Takahashi no Typing Satsuku, a typing tutor for the PlayStation 2, is better than this game. Type words to make Takumi execute a good drift! What? Even if the gameplay was incredibly fun, practically everything about the game wants to limit you to one feature or option, which is just inexcusable. I mean, it's so unheard of for a racing game to function and be structured like this. And it's almost like... an anti-racing game. Yeah, I mean, it has no redeeming factors, it limits you on countless things, your ears will suffer, your eyes will strain just trying to see anything, and its lack of challenge makes you keep playing it because you're always winning. I can't think of another racing game that has these kinds of restraints. It makes me wonder, how would you even market something like this? I mean, imagine seeing an advertisement on TV for this game. It would be... unthinkable. Are you sick and tired of playing racing games that give you too many choices? The hell is this? They expect me to pick one of these? Do you get anxiety every time the car selection screen appears? No, 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 10,000 is too many. Do you also suck ass at video games and hate the burden of having a challenge? Then you must play Initial D, Totalitarian Vengeance. It's a Japanese racing game that was created by stupid Americans so you know that it's good. In order to fix help our patients, we only put one song in the game at first. Studies have shown that listening to one song over and over again, have proven to help the brain become more acceptable to communism. To help ease the mind, we made every course hard as horseship to see. Racing games that give you too much light or draw distance have been statistically proven to burn your beautiful eyes. We have also exclusively implemented, fucked steering technology. This technology allows the car to move itself even when you are not touching the controls in order to torture help the player as much as possible. 
We believe that touching guardrails should reward the player, so we have removed any and all physics that actually make sense. The video game industry has not seen such traumatizing beneficial effects since the arcade smash hit, Polybius. For just 19. Easy payments of $5.99 per month, you will receive a game that will help you overcome your anxiety and fearness of good racing games. But order in the next 10 minutes and you will receive an official no fucks given blindfold so you can intensify your gaming experience by 320%. Initial D, Totalitarian Vengeance. One song, one car, one technique, one opponent, one mountain to grind on for 20 minutes. Side effects will apply. Please consult your physician to find out if this game is right for you. Do not play while using Viagra. To order now, call 1-800-SCRWYOU thank you and goodbye. Hey guys, thank you very much for watching the video, I really appreciate it. I quite literally risked my phone and health to make that opening scene just right. More on that is at the very end of this video, but if you enjoyed it then you know what to do with the like and subscribe buttons. I also have a Twitter where I post random things about upcoming videos, the link to that is in the description below. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. It was a hard up day. Just another heart of The making of this Initial D parody at the beginning of the video was definitely the most risky thing I had ever filmed. I was putting in jeopardy a $700 Galaxy S7 just for the sake of filming something for a YouTube video. Um, decided to tape it to the front bumper of my car. Now, we were originally going to just film inside the cabin, but that didn't really make it look fast enough, and if we were to speed it up, it would just look unrealistic. So, taping to the front bumper it was. Uh, did a test, went about 40 miles an hour, and it appeared that the tape did not loosen up at all. So we thought, okay, it's good. There is no way this phone is going to fall off. It is on there tight. So, went down one of my favorite togs, or mountain passes, and had to wait for a car at one point, and as we're sitting there, um, I didn't think to check the phone. I don't know why, but I didn't. And so we kept going for a little bit, and well, how about you watch what happened? The phone fell on this U-turn that I did. Wasn't the speeding, it wasn't the twists of the mountain that loosened it up. It was this quick U-turn that I did at the very end that I could have done slower. Ah, oh, it, it just kills me. So we pull over, and as I'm getting out of the car, I'm thinking, there's no way, there's no way that this f phone fell off. Of course, it's still there. It, it has to still be there. And <laughs> we look, and it's, it's not there. Uh, there's no phone there. And so we're thinking, oh my god, holy shit, it's it's somewhere. It's somewhere, and if we do find it, it's probably not working. It, it probably killed it. But we look over in the middle of the road, and there it is in the middle of the street. Just sitting there, and the auto box case that we put it in uh, was completely bent up, unusable. And my friend Daniel runs out and gets it, and to our utter shock and disbelief, it still works. Still works completely fine. This phone is completely fine. <laughs> no cracks on the screen. I mean, it already had like one or two cracks, but it didn't take any more damage to the front. I, I was amazed. The back glass, however, um, is pretty much completely shattered. Of course, it needs to be replaced. But I just feel extremely lucky that this expensive phone that I've only had for like six months with no insurance on it 
didn't die. Because if it did die, it sure as hell wasn't getting replaced. But we were thinking, how the hell did it, the back glass, you know, crack so badly? Because we watched the footage and it just fell off and rolled a few times. We, we didn't think that that would cause the whole thing to go kaboom. But what we think happened was, right after it stopped filming, I ran it over with one of my tires. Yeah. And the screen happened to be facing the concrete. So I just cracked the back glass. I didn't crack the screen. If it was the other way around, then I would have just totally would have demolished that screen and it would be ruined. So I just feel very grateful that my phone still works. And the, the camera's fine too. The lens glass was cracked up, but I just picked that away and it still takes clear pictures and videos. I was able to finish up filming this episode. Uh, the other part of this, my health, um, driving very fast through these windy roads um, isn't very good for my stomach because I was doing so many quick turns and really fast U-turns to get these drive-by shots. I, I had to pull over several times time. in the middle of the road to, to go pick up Daniel as he was, you know, filming. So that took a toll on me. And at one point we had everything filmed except for one more scene. And we decided to pull over and just stop for a few minutes just to rest. And uh, I felt good enough to get back in the car and do the last scene, which was um, stopping it very quickly in the middle of the road. But that did it, because shortly after Daniel got in and we started driving again, uh, my stomach couldn't handle it anymore. Uh, so that was a thing. <laughs> but I was fine, of course. And in the end, I'm, I'm really glad I did it, because I, I think this parody turned out quite well. Yes, lots of fun times filming these videos. Um, I'm probably not going to be putting my phone in any more jeopardy anytime soon. Please stay on the tripod. Oh, but it was worth it.